All right, I'm gonna cut right to the chase. I'm here with the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. John Carmack, and uh, we are gonna jump right into a demo already in progress of uh, John's incredible new VR head-mounted display. What's the interface? Is it just USB? Or? So uh, the tracker or? goes in through USB, and uh, the display is actually still an, an analog VGA, which is one of the problematic things on this. Um, Was that just a limitation of hardware you had? Or? So the, the way this has gone is I decided to treat myself after Rage on there. I bought uh, you know a head mount for $1,500 or so. It's a little cottage industry. There's a few places that do these things with integration, and it sucked. It was really bad. It was everything that I expected it to be. That it, it didn't look like there had been any progress in 20 years since, uh, you know, 15 years since I had looked at these things last. But when I got that, then I started taking it apart, both literally and figuratively, to go ahead and see what are all of the aspects on here on the, the sensing side, where when I wrote my own test software for this, I uh, using their library to go ahead and get the head tracking. It had 100 milliseconds of latency, and this just didn't make any sense to me. Why is it so bad? Did they need to have so much filtering? And I wound up, I, I integrate, I took the software that I wrote for Armadillo Aerospace, for our, our rocket control with fiber optic gyros. I took that gyro integration software and took raw values from the, the micro machine sensors on there, and all of a sudden it got way better. You know, I can only guess that they may have filtering from 10 years ago when, when they had really noisy sensors, and they're a lot better now. But then I took it a step further and I contacted the company, Hillcrest Labs, that makes the sensor for that. And one of those one of those days where it's good to be me, they knew who I was. <laughs> they I they recognized I they recognized my name. I told them what I was working on, and they were excited about that. And then they actually made a custom firmware for me that doubled the update rate on their sensor. So went from 125 to 250 hertz update. And that was one of those things. It didn't cost anything. There's no change in hardware. Somebody just had to get it done. A change of variable, and, right? Yeah, yeah. They went and actually it took. They had to fiddle a little bit more with that, yeah. and they couldn't get 512 hertz working initially. But still, they went. They they did some experiments, and they burned me some custom firmware and sent me some sample chips on there. So the sensing then was looking pretty good on there. Uh, I of course know how to deal with all the simulation software rendering, make sure GPUs don't buffer up things, and there's tricks that you have to do to make sure that you don't get buffering along all these other paths on this. But then you wind up pumping something out the back of your computer, and ideally that would be going directly to the displays and making something happen. But unfortunately what happens is a great many displays, they, it's the bane of the games industry where TVs do resolution conversion, 3D format conversion, content protection, motion interpolation, deblocking, and in theory most of these could be collapsed down to just a few scan lines of buffering on there, but in practice what happens is they've got a pipeline stage between every one of these, so you wind up with significant latencies coming out of that. And so like we've got the, the Sony head mount, which was released in February, I think, and really was a huge advance over. It was much better than the one that I picked up last year at half the price, and uh, Sony did a good job on that, but they're using evidently firmware from their television line, and there's 50 milliseconds of latency from the time something comes out of the back of my PC to the time photons wow. stream off the OLEDs. Right. And that's so frustrating because OLED technology is, is ideal for this because they switch in a microsecond where the very best LCDs, like a, like a retina display or something, they take about four milliseconds right. to switch. But unfortunately, a great number of embedded LCDs, and including the panel that we've got in here, take 20 to 30 milliseconds to switch from one to another. That's the, the whole LCD ghosting effect, which we've mostly gotten past on computer monitors, but uh, a number of embedded systems still suffer from that. So the Sony one's frustrating. No matter what I do ahead of that, I've got four milliseconds from the sensors, Windows sticks in another eight or 12 milliseconds in, in buffering in different places, USB time lags on there. I can render the scene in a couple milliseconds, right. do all of this stuff. Uh, but then I run into the wall of a 60 frames per second scan out, and then whatever the actual transition time of the display and uh, processing, if, 
if things aren't going well. And like the 60 frames per second limit is one of those things where flat panel displays were really sort of two steps forward, one step back for us. Before that, we had CRT monitors, big, bulky, clunky things that fall out of alignment, but they could all do 120 to 170 hertz updates right. on there. And you kind of needed that to not have flickering, but the industry then thought that, well, if we've got a, uh, if we've got a fluorescent light behind an LCD, it's constant, it's not flickering, we can just go back to 60 hertz right. like NTSC. And we've been stuck with that for years. And in fact, I think that's the most valuable thing coming out of 3D TV work is just that it's making people look at 120 hertz or higher displays. I'm still not a huge fan of 3D TV. I think I've done as good of a job as possible with uh, the BFG edition to support the 3D TVs on there. And it's, it's kind of neat, but it's a trade-off on there. And it's not uniformly wonderful, but higher display rates will be really good but there is not an existing head mount display that can do 120 hertz. Right. I actually was building one and I have, I had hoped to bring three different experiments here, but two of them didn't pan out quite in time on there, but I have an experimental head mount that updates with 120 hertz on OLEDs. And that gets you below a magic threshold, which is I believe right around 20 milliseconds, where if you can update, the, if, if it's 20 milliseconds from the time something physically moves in the real world to the time updated photons come off the screen and hit your eye, your brain buys that as you're looking into a stable world. Now that's almost, that's essentially impossible with a 60 hertz display because it takes 16 of those 20 milliseconds right. just to scan the whole display out. And in fact, if you take everything else out, it's interesting if you have a strong vertical reference, like a strong line, if you move your head back and forth like this. You get the tearing in the middle. Or, not, or if, you, if you lock it and you don't tear, you would swear that the whole world is warped <laughs> uh -huh. because you render at an instant in time, okay. but it scans out over 15 milliseconds. So by the time it's gotten to lighting up the pixels on the bottom, that's 15 milliseconds back in time. Okay. And no other dis no other system has really set it up with all the other latency pulled out so you can notice that. But once you fix everything else, you're left with that. It almost seems like you're straying into the realm of like cognitive science at some point there, here. There's a lot of perceptual issues that are very interesting there. And like one of the things that we can't do in displays yet, no existing display technology has, is the ability to have areas of the screen at different focuses. Uh, that's why some 10 or 15% of the population can't see 3D on 3D movies, and that's because your brain does two different things to perceive depth. One of them is the convergence, about the fact that your eyes have to turn a different amount in to focus on some spot. But the other thing is that you actually recognize the depth by focus and you have to focus slightly differently. Like when I'm looking at you, the whiteboard behind you is in a slightly different amount of focus. And all displays that we've got today, uh, any kind of 3D display, really any kind of display that we use has a fixed focal point. Everything is in a fixed point. So that's one of those perceptual cues that we don't have right now. I actually have some, some ideas about using multiple laser displays to be able to, to perhaps uh, you know, use like a triad of points to be able to fool the optical focusing mechanism. So there is interesting research to be done on display technologies there, but there are, the freight train that's pulling display technologies right now is mobile devices. When you have smartphones, mid-sized phones, tablets, mini tablets, all of these things are, you're right around 720p in most of these small devices, but 1080p devices are right around the corner. Toshiba has demoed a two and a half K display, which is all the resolution of your 30 inch monitor packed into a six inch display. Right. And these are exciting. And these are things that there's you know, hundreds of millions of units that drive these things. It's not a tiny little niche industry like the micro display they've, industry. They've reached an economy there. of scale there now, right? So yeah. there's exciting things there that are happening regardless of what anybody does. So the question then becomes, what else needs to be done? If we've got this moving by itself, I know I can handle the software side. Uh, the rate gyro sensors are uh, can be made to work just great there. One of the other things is the ability to have actual sense of, we sense attitude with this, but you really have a lot of depth perceptions from very subtle motions of your eye where everybody focuses on stereoscopy as being two eyes rendered like that. But even if you cover one eye, you still get a very good sense of the depth in the world. Part of it's depth from focus, but a lot of it is just these subtle millimeter level movements that your head has. And then when you intentionally do something, you say, I want to look at something, you know, there's bending and leaning and that that path that your eye takes through space is also very important. I do, I, I do an interesting thing in this demo here where most 3D games, you're this disembodied eyeball that rotates in space. I'm, for this, I make it a head and neck model where I know you're actually pivoting down here, 
So when you look, okay. your eye takes a little path through there. So you get a little bit of the parallax, but it's only exactly right for that one particular thing that I, I mapped on there. And there are other sensors like the, the Razer Hydra from Sixth Sense. It's, a, it's sort of a Wiimote-y like thing where you have two things, but they have both attitude and position sensing on there. And at first I thought, oh, this will be perfect for a head mount display on there. But unfortunately, while it has quite a bit of precision, it gives millimeter level uh, results on there. It's not very accurate in the sense that I, you know, if you look over here, it'll give you a number back, but it might be 15 degrees off or it might be tilted. The whole physics accuracy, accuracy precision stuff you're supposed to have learned in high school. And I, it's, I, it was frustratingly close because I could set up a demo with that where you could do this whole looking like this and you could even get down on the floor. You could get down, crouch down, put your hand on the virtual floor and look at the pebbles down there. And that was deeply fundamentally cool, but it had too many drawbacks where it was only right in this way. When you looked over here and did that, you were tilted at a different angle. I spent some time trying to calibrate it out, but it, I didn't get that ready for prime time, ready for showing on right. air. Well, that's one of the axes. You know, resolution's gonna get better. We're gonna get to 120 hertz displays. I'm haranguing all the display vendors about this, making my important things the, you know, one of the things that I, the, removing the latency, one of the cases that I've been making that shows the ridiculousness of it all, where I can measure 50 milliseconds of delay on this. And I do that by, I have a program that switches colors when I hit a button and you put a high speed camera here, you mash it and you wait, you count frames until it switches. Right. And it's 50 milliseconds for that over uh, a very fast display. That is more time than it takes to send a packet from America to England. <laughs> You know, yeah. that's just ridiculous. Yeah. But it's because router people and switch people care about latency. They know it's important, so they don't pile it up. Right. Display people don't know yet, but I'm trying to educate all yeah. of them about We're that. We're getting there. I'm, so. I'm, getting the, I'm getting the hand wave from okay, off so camera. Okay, so we must we, hurry. Uh, so <laughs> right. if you could, so, real quick, before I'm dying to strap this thing yeah. on, but if you could just kind of real quickly just talk us through and kind of give us, a, for the benefit of the camera, kind of a, a visual analog here between your movements yeah. and what's So happening. what we've got here is I have been pursuing, I've got a couple research devices that I've built but uh, I ran across this guy, Palmer Lucky, that had been building, he's got this enormous collection of head mounts and he does a lot of work like this. And he had built this in his workshop that has a 90 degree horizontal field of view and 110 degree vertical. So it's enormous compared to like the Sony device. It's five times the solid angle air viewing area that you get on here. It puts you in there. Now the resolution's low because it's basically the resolution of one eye from here stretched over both eyes and that enormous field of view. So you can resolve pixels in here. For some people that's more distracting than others. But uh, the cool thing about this is he sent me one of his prototype units to work with this and I integrated my sensors and a mounting strap and the software for this. Uh, but these are gonna be made available as kits called the Oculus okay. Rift. And the amazing thing about this is that this is $7.99. It's a huge bargain compared to anything that came before it. Uh, the kits on this are gonna be $500. Add on a tracker and a copy of Doom 3 with it, it'll be $600 plus some shipping on there, but it's still amazingly cheap. And this field of view, you couldn't get in a $10,000 head mount display. In, wow. uh, actually, you still can't today. It's, uh, it's that much higher. Now, what, ha what makes this possible is that instead of using exotic optics and huge tra lens trains on here, this is a simple set of optics in here, carefully chosen lenses balanced to this display on here, but it gives the display a very warped fisheye view on there. It's still immersive if you look at it, but you move your head around and it's the world's wiggling and moving on here. So instead of using advanced optics on here, I correct for all of this in software. So you can see what it's doing here where I wow. invert the projection that the lenses do. And this, you do this all in a pixel shader, it's non-linear math, you can't do it in a projection matrix like you would only have years ago. But so I map the distortion, I correct for it there, and then when you look through it here, it comes out right. So you've got something that's a panel display back here that will follow follow cell phone development trends. We'll yeah. be able to get better ones in the coming years. Right. Uh, cheap optics, lightweight on here, and then software that can correct and make it all work right for it. Yeah, that, that is some really impressive yeah, stuff. And so the great thing on this was, I so this had been my little hobby project, uh -huh. but then the BFP edition for Dune 3 gave, it legitimized my work. Okay. I'm like, okay, this is something that I can integrate the 3D TV support, but the head mount display stuff is, it makes even this eight year old game 
a fundamentally different experience. It really is like nothing you've ever played like that. That's, that's, and not it's, it's, it, 10 times more graphics power doesn't give you that level of sure. intensity. It's a little mind bending at first, getting your get kind of your, 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 your neck and your thumb to work in concert, yeah. you know, because they both kind of are approximating the same actions in some way. You talk about this kit being relatively inexpensive compared to what else is out there, but you know, obviously you still had to hand build it. Yeah. Do you see this, this quality of experience uh, becoming available in like an all-in-one solution at some point? Is it getting to that point? So what I think is going to happen is I'm, if we get these kits going out and you build the first batch of 100 of them, they go to the whole hacker maker crowd of people that are excited to build kits and we'll see a lot of evolution there. We'll see all sorts of different 3D printed ma uh, mounts for these, ways to do the interocular adjustment or focusing adjustment. Lots of different stuff can be experimented on. It's actually an amazing opportunity for people that there's lots of people that can do this level of work and they can actually make a difference in how VR is going to evolve here, where even with the Sony head mount here, there's a little cottage industry of people. The ergonomics on this are not good, so people mount them in hats and welding goggles and all this different stuff, taking them apart, doing things. And that's interesting, but with something like this, where you've got such a fundamentally stronger experience and people can make a bigger difference with it, that's going to be exciting. I think that you'll see people do novel, innovative things on this. And so give that you know, 12 months on there where we have a commercial game out for this so that no matter what people hack up together, they'll have something to show it off with. It'll have that existence proof value of, here, let me show you something really awesomely cool that I've been working on. And given, you know, give it a year and we've got another generation or two of display panels on there, uh, integrate the other sensors, do some of this other stuff on here, convince some other developers, game developers to enable support for something like this. And I could easily see somebody, one of the majors, producing a real polished piece of hardware in a year or two's time on this. And this is, I uh, again, it's more impressive when somebody's followed this for a decade on yeah. here and you've tried the old ones that are really no good at all. Right. Because this is very much what people imagine the experience is, virtual yeah. reality. You block out the rest of the world right. and you're around looking around in the world and we're finally at the cusp of being able to deliver Right, that. especially amid the cacophony of E3 yeah. here. I was absolutely isolated in there. It's, uh, that was really a singular experience. I'm, I'm really happy to have gotten to try it. I know we're, we're bumping up against our time here, yeah. but I can't thank you all enough right. you for giving it. us this chance. Thanks, Thanks a lot, John. Yeah.